Welcome to Maple Avenue Christian Church, a great place to connect, grow, serve, and share. We hope that through today's service, you will connect with God and build community with Christ followers. Please let us know how we can pray for you this week. Just fill out a connection card located at the back. To help us stay better connected, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook. Don't forget to turn on notifications so you don't miss a thing. To be added to our email updates or if you are having trouble receiving our emails, please contact the church office. Before we get started, please take a moment to silence your phone. Here's what's going on at MACC. Sermon questions for small group or personal reflection are now available on our website or at the back of the worship center. If you are new here, we'd like to invite you to our next Discover MACC dinner. Together, we will enjoy a meal and a short discussion about who we are at Maple Avenue Christian Church. While you are out trick-or-treating, stop by Maple Avenue Christian Church with your kids for some scare-free fun, October 31st from 5 to 7 p.m. There's plenty to do to prepare for this event. To help with that night or donate candy, contact our children's minister, Amy Morris. Thanksgiving is quickly approaching. This is a great time for us to be the church to our community. Look in your bulletin to see how you can help with the MACC Thanksgiving Baskets. When you bring your bag of items, please set them in this hallway right here. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Be sure to check us out online to stay updated throughout the week. But for now, can't say we didn't tell you. Will you please stand as we worship our Lord together? I want to read Psalm 98, verses 1 through 3. It says, Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. So let's give praise to our God who has provided salvation for us. Never. 
through the blood of Jesus, through his death and his resurrection, for us to be in a relationship with you. And you want us. You desire that with us. Lord, just draw our hearts to you. Maybe some of us have felt distant from you. Lord, just draw us with your loving kindness. Help us to taste and see that the Lord is good and there is nothing that can compare to you. Nothing in this world will ever satisfy like you satisfy. Thank you, Father, for loving us so much. Lord, we praise you this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
your word is true. There is no truth but yours. Lord, just help us to stand on your truth, stand on your promises, learn to walk by your spirit that you've given us. Lord, help us to know what that means. Thank you, Father, for patience. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Donnie Case. I'm senior minister here at Maple Avenue Christian Church, and I hope you're as excited to be here this morning as I am as we come together as a church family to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If it's your first time here, I want to invite you to 
stop by our hospitality room after our service, all you'll do is go out these doors in the back, okay? And then there's a red wall, and there's a door in that red wall, and just go in there, and Miss Jen, I think she's here, yeah, she's here, she'll greet you, get you all set up, and then I'll be in in a few minutes. Just want to take the opportunity to get to, to meet you and talk with you a little bit and learn a little bit more about you. <clears throat> also want to say hello to all those who are watching online this morning. We know that um, a lot of people check us out online before they ever come and worship with us, so we look forward to seeing you soon. I also want to give a big shout out to our Macomb High School football team this morning, who for the first time, yeah, first time in school history, that they've had 10 wins in a season and the first time in school history that they've gone 10 and 0. So they're undefeated. Uh, they beat QND last night in the first round of state playoffs, 28-14. So congratulations to Coach Horrell and the rest of the Bomber football team. Uh, this morning I want to begin by talking about our identity. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Let's call her Bonnie. Okay, does that work? Bonnie work? Jenny? Betty, whatever you want to call her. Let's call her whatever. <clears throat> but there are many people, I believe, who could fit her description. Maybe you could fit her description. Strikingly beautiful. So that leaves me out. I'm not there. She was intelligent. She was well-dressed, but she was really insecure. She talked of her loneliness and of her hunger to find love. She desperately longed for someone who would give her love. How is it that Bonnie, Betty, Jenny, whoever, can possess so many outwardly beautiful things but lacked self-confidence? When Bonnie was nine, she grew five inches. And during junior high school, she was always the tallest girl in class. At 5'10", she stopped growing. And now, as a woman, her height just kind of sets off her beauty. But she cannot believe that. She doesn't believe that. She won't believe that. She cannot be, uh, remove from her mind all the memories of school dances when all the other girls were asked to dance and she was standing on the wall because she was taller than all the guys. She recalls all the hurtful words of her classmates calling her names. Maybe some of you know what it's like to be in a group be the only one not chosen I'm sure some of us do it can make you feel like a piece of junk there have been all kinds of studies done in the last 40 years indicating that the way we see ourselves determines to a large degree the way we act and the way we react to life situations so if we see ourselves as a loser we end up to a large degree acting like a loser if we see ourselves as a victim, we end up to a large degree letting people victimize us. If we see ourselves as uncreative, we never come up with any creative ideas. If we see ourselves as a piece of junk, we begin to think that we're nothing but garbage. However, if we see ourselves as successful, then we tend to repeat success. We tend to do the things that made us successful from what we've done in the past. Like Bonnie, we set ourselves up. Our beliefs about ourselves determine our behavior. As Bonnie's story indicates, the, the belief that we have about ourselves originates for many of us in childhood. Unfortunately, some or many of those beliefs are false. They're false. Many people have a negative view of themselves because of erroneous information they've received from misinformed and unauthorized sources in their lives. We need to look at ourselves from a different perspective. We need to hear from an informed, authorized source. Does that make sense? There was a student of architecture who entered a nationwide contest for a building design. And her design was judged by a panel of architects from all across uh, the, the, the nation. And her design received honorable mention. You know, it's a nationwide thing. It was honorable mention. It's second place. That's great. I'd be elated if I won second place nationwide in anything. But she was visibly upset. She was depressed. That didn't sit well with her. She believed that her design was the best design. 
So at lunch, on the last day of the convention, she was sitting over her uneaten sandwich, looking over her creation, her design, all that she'd poured her heart and soul into, when this elderly gentleman walked up and started to look at it. He was looking at her design also. And finally, he said, not knowing who had designed the building, he didn't know who it was, he said, this one, I think, is the best of the lot. The judges merely had given her work honorable mention, but the old man had liked it. And the young student went home elated. Why? Because the elderly gentleman was Frank Lloyd Wright, probably the greatest architect of our time. When the authority tells us something, we can count on it. And God is the authority on who we are. Not all these people that have spoken harsh and hurtful and mean words into our lives. He's our creator. He's the one who knits us together in our mother's womb before one of our days comes to pass. He's our authority on who we are. He gives us the correct information. He's the one we should be listening to about who we are. An identity crisis, though, is not exclusive to people, individuals. Institutions can also suffer from identity crisis. Organizations can lose their sense of purpose and mission and calling. The church can also suffer an identity crisis. Local churches often face an identity crisis. In 1 Peter, that's where we're going to be this morning, 1 Peter chapter 2, in 1 Peter, Peter wrote to local churches that faced identity crisis. These congregations, they were scattered all about the Roman Empire, the province of Asia Minor, <clears throat> and had been largely ignored and considered very irrelevant. Didn't mean a lot. But as they grew in influence... The society grew very hostile toward all these churches and against their beliefs. It would soon become genocidal persecution under Emperor Nero. And so Peter wrote to these churches to urge them to stand firm in their faith. Peter, in, first, in chapter 1, says what God has done for each one of us. And in chapter 2, which is where we're going to be, he talks about what God says about us. So as believers in Jesus Christ, he informs us of who we are. So the Bible's our authority on who we are, not these misinformed, supposed authorities, but God and his word. He explains what it means to be a Christian. He also explains what it means to be the church. In, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, Peter teaches that to be a Christian is to be a part of the church. Okay? The climax of the passage is in verses 9 and 10, and that's what we're going to look at this morning, where Peter answers the question, what is the church? And I want to tell you what the church is not. First of all, the church is not a building. So if you came here this morning thinking that the church is the building, and, oh, wow, what a nice church, then, then you're, you're wrong, you're misled, you're misinformed. Because the church is not a building. The church are the men and women, the boys and girls who are sitting beside you this morning, sitting around you, all these smiley faces that are so excited to be here. Just look around at them. Make them smile. The, this is the church. It's not our atrium. It's not this room. It's not all this. You are the church, men and women. That's why Peter, when he writes to the church, it's not just one church. It's the men and women who have given their lives to Jesus Christ. The church is also not an organization you joined. It's not that. The church is not a service you attend. How many, how many of you have heard people say, well, I'm going to go to church this morning? Raise your hand. Have you ever heard people say that? I'm going to go to church. How many of you this morning say, oh, I'm going to go to church this morning? Yep, I'm going to attend service. It's what we do. But that's not the reality. The reality is, I'm going to go be church. I'm going to be church with other be churchers. All right? So we're going to be church together. It's not the building. It's not a service you attend. The church is also not a charity you support. 
A lot of people, they come into churches and they think, oh, I got to give, I got to help with this and this and this and this. Well, that's good, but don't let that be what you think church is all about. It's not just a charity you support. It's a place where you give your time. It's a place where you give your energy. It's a place where you serve. It's a place where you walk alongside other people who are broken, who are hurting. And we have to do that for each other here. The church is not a club you socialize with. We don't take membership dues here. All people are welcome here. All people are welcome here because everybody in this great big old world is hurting. Everybody needs healing. Everybody needs Jesus. So it's not our job to keep people out. It's our job to invite people in, no matter what, because we all need healing. So don't sit in judgment over somebody else. Invite them in. I got a whole series on that next year. I'm excited. It's 14 weeks long. I'm excited about it. But we'll, get, we'll talk more about that later. The church's identity is not based, listen, the church's identity is not based on our ethnicity, on our nationality, on our background, our status, or our agenda. That's not what the church is based on. The church, listen, the church is the redeemed community of God's people in Jesus Christ. That's what the church is. I'll say it again. The church is the redeemed community of God's people in Jesus Christ. I hope that excites you this morning. I hope that you are a part of that redeemed community. And if you're not a part of that redeemed community, then later this morning we want to give you opportunity to talk to somebody about what it means to be a part of God's redeemed community in Jesus Christ. The church is Christ's bride. The church is Christ's body. He's in charge. It's all his. And the identity of the church is based on our relationship to Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Are we tracking the Apostle Peter realizes this. Actually, I realize this is what the Apostle Peter is saying. He didn't realize this. But this is what he's writing. And so he warns and he explains to the Christians he's writing to how they should embrace their identity, their new identity in Christ. We need to embrace our new identity in Christ so that they, these Christians that Paul's writing to, so they don't blend in like chameleons, okay? We don't want to blend in like the rest of the world. Some Christians, however, are like chameleons in that they try to blend in with the world. They don't want to be noticed, so they sit motionless. They, they blend, you know, blend again, looking like the rest of the world. Instead, what we need to do is embrace our new identity in Christ. Can I ask you guys to stand with me? We're going to be in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10, so hopefully you're there. And I want to read that for us, <clears throat> have you follow along. And so God's word says this. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Verse 10, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the mercy that we've received. The mercy that comes from your grace, the mercy that blesses us, the mercy that gives us hope, the mercy that we all need in our lives. We thank you for that. Father, we pray that you'd be merciful with us this morning as we come together to worship you, that we would honor and glorify you in everything that we do and say in this place today. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. Thank you. Listen, the first thing right off the bat is this. We have a new identity in Christ. Why? Because we are God's special possession. Anybody in here ever felt like the world or people around them have dismissed them? That they have just thought of you as waste, as garbage, as trash, as junk? And so nobody ever invests in you. Nobody ever talks to you. You're always the last resort. You're always the last one called to go to a movie. You're always the last for everything. Listen to me. This is true. You, as an individual, 
who have accepted Christ, you are God's special possession. You have caught his eye. You have his attention. You are his special possession. I want you guys to own that. I want you to claim that for yourself. So I want you to say that with me this morning. It's going to be on the screen. I am, say it with me, okay? I am God's special possession. Do you believe that? Do you own that? I want you to walk out knowing that you are God's very special possession. That's what Peter wanted these folks to know. They're being persecuted. Life is coming down hard all around them. And Peter says, listen, you're God's special possession. I know things are tough. I know many of you have lost your homes. I know you don't know where your next meal is coming from. I know that you're threatened with your lives each and every day. But you're God's special possession. Allow that to encourage you as you go through your day. And as his special possession, Peter tells us through a growing progression, so we're going to look at three things that are growing, that a growing possession, that, that we are, first of all, a chosen people. You'll notice none of these points are original with me. They all come right out of the scripture, right? But they are. We are a chosen people. Now, the word chosen in the Greek language is the word ekletos, and it ultimately speaks of the grace of God. So it should be emphasized that the, the proper conclusion, the interpretation of the meaning of chosen in each New Testament use depends on the context in which it's used. So ekletos means those selected, those picked out. And the scripture usually defines one who is the object of choice or of divine favor. Okay, Although it's difficult to understand with finite minds, it's important to note that the fact that some are chosen does not imply the rejection of of those not chosen. God does not predestine some to eternal death. Peter uses terminology commonly used in reference to Israel. For example, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verse 6, if you want to turn over there, we'll invite you to do so. Deuteronomy 7, 6 says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Okay, so this is the nation of Israel. You are a holy people, holy to the Lord your God. To the Lord, your, uh, the Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. In the same way, Israel was called to be God's chosen people on the earth and to be witnesses for him. In the same way, the church is now God's chosen people. Not just the nation of Israel. That hasn't anything to do with him. Since the new covenant through Jesus, through his blood, later on we're going to take communion. We're going to talk about how it's a new covenant through his blood, I think. Jeff's doing communion meditation. I don't know, so I hope I didn't set you up for something bad. But anyway, that's what it's about. This, this choosing is all about Jesus chose us. So under this new covenant, the church. Who's the church? We are. Not the building, but the church we are God's chosen people. And so this choosing is not because we're better than others or, or because we would respond to him. This choosing is a work totally of God's grace. It's his mercy lavished on us. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Are you there? Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Verse 2, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This choosing is all to the praise of His glorious grace, His unmerited favor, His mercy on us. Now, this was important for these Christians to hear because they were the ones that were deemed by others to be the scum of the earth. They were rejected, and therefore they were treated like, like that. They were treated as such. So this choosing represented their, their salvation. They were chosen by God to receive salvation and to enjoy him forever. 
the psalmist wrote in Psalm 33, verse 12. He said, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. I want to read that again. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. Jesus said in John 15, 16, he said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Christians, we are not better people than any other man or woman, but we are blessed. So never think of yourselves as better. You're not better than the sinner who's rejecting God. You're blessed. Because if we start to look at ourselves as better, we stop seeing that there are people who need God and then we just want to make him all for ourselves, put him in our little box and store him away from the rest of the world. As such, we are a distinct kind of human being, almost like a separate genetic variety, a chosen people. We cannot be a chameleon. If we're a Christian, we cannot just blend in with the rest of the world. We have been specially chosen by God for his own very specific purposes. What is your purpose? I can't tell you. But if you spend time with the creator, the one who knitted you together in your mother's womb, and you spend real time with him, he'll reveal that to you. We oftentimes try to seek it from others who are not authorized sources. We need to go to the authorized source, to the one who created us in his image. We are a child of the king of kings. So Peter progresses. So we're a chosen people, but now he progresses. He says, you're a royal priesthood. Does that like resonate with anybody in this room this morning? We're a royal priesthood? Probably not. Because we don't live in a culture of monarchy. We don't live in a culture of temples and priests. So it probably doesn't resonate with us. But it did for these folks back then. Boy, this was a, this was a shout of, uh, of exclamation to these folks. Uh, an audience that was probably primarily Jewish, this would have stood out. You see, in the Old Testament, the monarchy and the priesthood were strictly separated. And now Peter's combining them, a royal priesthood? No, they were separated. They, they had nothing to do with one another in, in their occupation, in their, their uh, line. Priests came from the lineage of Aaron, from the tribe of Levi, right? And so only they could approach God at the temple. Only they could offer the sacrifices. The rest of the Jews, they couldn't do this. So there was strict segregation, very strict. These priests, they could go into places that the rest of us couldn't go. Okay? Uh, the king was also special in Israel because he was anointed with oil by the priest. Remember, David was anointed by Samuel. He was, he was then known as king. This means he was equipped, he was empowered by God to do the task of ruling Israel and fighting the battles of the Lord for Israel on, his behalf, on her behalf. We see the Holy Spirit coming upon the kings to win battles. Similarly, the priest was anointed and therefore empowered by the Holy Spirit to minister to God and to the people. So they were both godly positions, are supposed to be, but they had different tasks. But again, these privileges were not for regular Jews. They were strictly separated. We see the, the, the strict separation of these two roles in two kings who were judged by God for trying to combine the priesthood and the kingship. Okay, so the first one, King Saul. Probably most of you thought of that, right? King Saul did this. King Saul was anxious to go into battle. He was ready to go. He was rip roaring and ready. And, and instead of waiting for Samuel, the priest, to come and offer the sacrifice to the Lord, Saul took it upon himself to do that. In 1 Samuel uh, chapter 13, verses 8, 8 through 14, I encourage you to read that this week, God told him that because of this, he had sought a man after his own heart to rule. And of course, he's talking about who? David, say it with conviction. You've got confidence. He was looking for David. Saul was judged for trying to, to merge the priesthood and the kingship. 
We also saw this in 2 Chronicles. We can see it there in chapter 26, 16 through 21, with King Uzziah. Remember King Uzziah? Uzziah became very successful and ever very, very prideful. He felt that because he was so great that he should be able to go in and burn the incense in the temple, right? But he couldn't. That wasn't, uh, that wasn't his responsibility. Again, that was the work specifically designed for the priest to do. The priests gathered together, they confront him, and they said, Uzziah, you will not be blessed by the Lord because you have been unfaithful. And so King Uzziah became angry at all this stuff, and he reached out to burn the incense anyway. Remember what happened? Leprosy. Leprosy broke out on, on his head because God judged him. Then he stepped down from being king and passed the kingship on to his son. He died a leper. Therefore, the privilege of being a royal priesthood, man, this would have stood out to these folks. You're combining the two? You're combining this? A royal priesthood is a merging of these two lines together. The line of Judah was for kings, the line of Aaron for the priest. How is this reality possible? The only way this is possible is because under the new covenant, under the blood of Jesus, there is no longer a priest who must come from a specific tribal line. So the, the writer of Hebrews, man, he labors over this. He argues through this. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 17, he, he says that Christ, our high priest, comes from the order of Melchizedek, who was the former king and priest of Salem. He's the one Abraham offered tithes to back in Genesis chapter 14. Remember that? I hope you do. This was something prophesied about the coming Messiah, that he would be this. Psalm 110 verse 4 says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. He would be a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, a, 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 a kingly priest, a royal priest. Christians being royal priest represents the fact that we have been united with in and through Jesus Christ. We are his body. And, and whatever glory Christ receives, we receive as well. Romans 8, 17 calls us co-heirs with Christ. Do you own that? Do you allow that to just bless your spirit? To know that you're a co-heir with the one and only Son of God? The Messiah? It means we will reign with him eternally and here on earth. We don't have to take a back seat. Our role is to draw men and women unto himself and to lead people in the worship of him as priest. And so this should stand out. Peter wants them to realize that they are different from the world because they know Christ. We cannot be, listen, we cannot be a royal priesthood and be a chameleon just blending in with the rest of the culture. Finally, he progresses to this. So we're a chosen people, right? We're a royal priesthood. Then he says this. He says, finally, we are a holy nation. We are a holy nation. This, again, was terminology used of Israel. And so this primarily Jewish audience, boy, they would have jumped on that. They would have gone right back probably to Exodus 19.6. When they were called a holy nation, Exodus 19, 6 says, You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. They were set apart by God for good works, to serve him and to worship him. In the same way, we have been chosen and set apart for good works. This separates us from the world. This itself should keep us from being a chameleon. Look at what Paul said about believers in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Okay? He says, for we are God's handiwork. I like that. We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Uh, to do. And so the word he uses here for handiwork is the Greek word poema. It's where we get our English word poem. And just like any carefully uh, well-crafted poem, God has and is carefully crafting and constructing us through various events, through all kinds of teachings, and even trials for the purpose of producing good works for his glory. God chose us to display his beautiful artwork, his character, 
his good works to the rest of the world. He uses us to do that. And so the idea of holiness has the positive element of righteousness, has the idea of good works, but it also has the negative element of staying unspotted or, or free from pollution of sin, being uncontaminated. James chapter 1, verse 27, James wrote this. He said, religion that God our Father accepts as pure, as faultless, as unadulterated, as spotless, is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Do you hear it? Hear what he's saying? It's our refrain. He's saying, hey, don't blend in. Don't be a chameleon. Stand out. Look different. You're not supposed to look like everybody else. You're not supposed to act like everybody else because you aren't like everybody else. You're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. So act like it. God has chosen to call out a holy nation to represent him and to serve others. You cannot sit idly by on the sidelines of life and blend in with the world like a chameleon if you do indeed love and serve God. If you do that, you're going to stand out. You're going to be noticed. We are not chameleons. We are a chosen people. We were not picked last for the dance. We were not picked last for the game. We were not picked last for anything else. God chose us. You're a royal priesthood. You are a prince or a princess in the family of God. Do you believe that? I hope you do. It gives you worth. It gives you your value. Not all the things we do in this world, but because of this. This is why human life is valuable. You're a holy nation. You have an eternal destiny. No matter what others may say or do to you, you are God's special possession. Because of what God has done for us, we can proclaim the praises of the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are God's handiwork, his masterpiece, his creation. Therefore, we declare praise to him for who we are. Peter goes on to say, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We are his own. We are chosen. We have worth. We are found capable. We are forgiven. When we have that and know that the world's judging system just doesn't matter, then we know we are not junk. We are not something to be set aside and expelled and ignored. We are God's if we trust and believe in him. Christians, don't be chameleons, please. Stand out in this world. Don't run after the things of the world. There's a couple of big lies that the world tries to throw at us. And one of the big lies is our outward appearance is all that matters. I mean, just watch TV for a few minutes and you'll see that. Striving after the perfect body, the perfect hair, face, style, man. You know, commercial after commercial about losing this much weight and growing hair back and all this stuff. It's what we chase after. And it's robbed so many Christians of their true identity. It's robbed them of their true beauty. If you've ever looked into the mirror and you hate what you see, you're guilty of buying in to the lies of this world, the false identity. The reason many Christians struggle to accept our face, our body, is because we view physical beauty as the means to finding our value and our worth, and it's not there. It's because we're created in the image of God. It's because we're chosen, his special possession. Another lie the world throws out is you have to be in a relationship to have value. I have a lot of single Christian friends. The relationship status trips up so many Christians. We long for Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright to come into our lives. We long for a little romantic excitement, all those things. We long to forever say goodbye to that title single. And all these things are fine to desire. They really are. But when they become a I must have this to be happy kind of thing, then they start to steal our true identity. I just don't want you to fall into that because the world tries to just pound that into people. 
And the church is probably one of the worst places in the world. What, you're still single? What's the matter with you? Ain't nothing the matter with them. I'll stand up for them right now. Ain't nothing in the world the matter with them. What's the matter with you? Do you only see their value because they're in a relationship? Because they're married? Then shame on you. They have purpose and value because they're created in the image of God. God did not design us to find our satisfaction in fulfillment in a guy or a girl. We are defined by our identity as a child of God. We are a royal priesthood. And there's another lie Satan tries to trip us up in, and that's your talents, your abilities. Mm. Unfortunately, a lot of young people have their identity tied up in their academic success. I'm the honor student or... On the other spectrum, me, I'm the class clown, whatever it is. Others are identified by extracurricular activities. Well, I'm a basketball player, I'm a baseball player, I'm a football player, I'm a band member, I'm a soccer player, whatever. And adults, we do the same thing. We identify ourselves by our careers, don't we? We do. We identify ourselves by our careers, our financial status. We really like to identify ourselves by that. Or the neighborhood we live in. Listen, the minute... The very minute we allow uh, what we do to define who we are becomes our means of measuring our value and worth. Only our identity as a child of God and a follower of Christ will last. That's all that matters. We are a holy nation. Are you living as a chameleon, blending in with the rest of the world, or are you embracing your new identity in Christ. I want to encourage you to embrace your new identity in Christ. I really do. This morning, I want to ask our elders and our staff and the people in our prayer team, if you guys would get up right now while everybody is sitting, you don't have to blend in like everybody else. It's supposed to be fine. But anyway, if you guys make your way around the room, <clears throat> and we just want to make folks available, because I'm sure that the Holy Spirit's speaking to some of your hearts because I believe there's also maybe someone here this morning who has yet to embrace their new identity in Christ. And they want prayer for that. I also believe there are some here this morning who want to begin a relationship with Jesus to have that new identity. And if this is you, please know, please know that you're invited to go to these folks that are standing along the walls this morning and allow them to minister to you through prayer through conversation. I'm going to pray, and when I'm done praying, we're going to have a song. Judy and Rick are going to lead us in that. And while they're singing that song, we're going to ask you to stand while there's that song. And you can slip out and go talk to these folks. And after that song's over, that doesn't mean everything's shut down. That's just in this service time. But if you have something you want to talk to, look at these folks. Find them after the service. Get with them. Talk to them. Doesn't have to be just in here. Maybe you're sitting by somebody that you would really like to talk to about this. Do that. We're just providing a means. We're not saying this is the rule, okay? So would you please stand with me and let me pray for us this morning. Father, we come to you. We thank you for our opportunity to come together in your uh, presence together with one another to worship you. I pray, God, that we would glorify you in the way we live our lives. Help us not to be chameleons. Help us not to blend in with the rest of the world. <laughs> But help us to live for you in everything that we do and say so that you receive all honor and glory and praise. It's in the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I
from Luke, um, chapter 22, verses um, 15, we'll start with verse 15, and this is uh, the covenant Donnie was talking about, Um, this is um, as Jesus was eating the last supper with his disciples, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not eat, I'm sorry, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So prior to this, um, at Passover, they were sacrificing the lamb, and then at Passover, they put the blood over the uh, doorway. Um, And then Jesus came and um, made this new covenant. And so I want to skip to our famous scripture that we all memorize first, John 3.16. So God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believed in him should have eternal life. And so, when I was thinking about what I was going to say today, I uh, thought of a story, um, and I know when I was teaching um, uh, a couple months ago, I told a story to um, that group, so I'm sorry some of you have heard it, but um, in in my office, I um, end up dealing with skin cancers, and I was taking um, some skin cancers off a gentleman's face, and when I do that, and just start just casual conversation, um, try to distract them a little bit and pass the time for me as well. And so um, this gentleman had three different cancers, so we were in there for a while taking them off, and 
you know, I was kind of saying, hey, sorry, you know, for, you know, you have to go through this. And he said, this is nothing. I was a POW in Vietnam for six months. So he was captured in Vietnam and he was thrown into a pit, uh, basically a big hole in the ground. And for six months, they would um, get one meal of something he didn't even know what it was every day thrown in there to them. Um, every once in a while, they would drag them out, ask them questions, thinking they knew more than they did, and as he put it, rough them up a bit and then throw them back in. And, uh, you know, he said that um, they would often tell him, you know, we don't want you here, and he would often say, I don't want to be here either. Send me home. But he said they didn't have a sense of humor with that. And um, finally, after six months, um, basically, um, the U.S. came in and took over the area, and so he was freed and uh, got to come home. And so um, he was dressed in his army attire and flew into Chicago. And before he got out of the airport, he was spit on twice um, because people didn't want people at Vietnam. So how does that relate to communion? God so loved the world, he gave his only son. His son would be beaten and tortured for something he didn't do, didn't want anything to do with it, spit on, and die for each one of us. So thinking about this gentleman and what he went through, you know, thinking if it was your child, would you send them to Vietnam if you knew that they were going to go through that? be beaten and tortured, spit on? Of course not. I, there's no way I would send my son. It's knowing what was going to happen. God loved you enough he did that. He knew what was going to happen. He knew what Jesus was going to go through. But he was doing it for each one of you. God so loved you that he gave his one and only son. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to this time, the time of communion, please help us to remember the sacrifice that you made for us. As we're remembering today during this act, help us remember this covenant that we no longer have to sacrifice anything else because you sacrificed for us. And now we just have to believe in you and glorify and honor you with our actions. And just help us to remember everything that you do for us each and every day and that you love us and that you sacrificed for us. In Jesus' name we pray.
Matthew, Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your, your heart is also. And so um, right now, um, as we come to our tithes and offerings, and um, we have boxes in the back um, and on the side, um, but this is our opportunity to give back, and we should do it with a joyful heart. And this is an opportunity not just to write a check or put a dollar in there. It's to think about where is your heart during all of this, and you know how important is it to you? You know, is it more important than how much you're going to spend on your cheeseburger in the drive-through on the way home? You know, I mean, what what does it mean to you? And so, um, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, um, please change our hearts to be um, a reflection of you in everything that we do. And whether that is through our money and our tithing right now or through our actions uh, throughout this week, help us, as Don would put it, not to be a chameleon, but to, to stand out for you. And just thank you for all the blessings you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. I want to read Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. It says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us, and the one he loves. Like Donnie said this morning, you are chosen, you are loved, you're adopted, and you are favored. So let's stand and sing this last song together as we remember this.
you are new here this morning, Donnie would love to meet you back in the hospitality room back there where the red wall is. And we need to move all the chairs today. And there will be dollies taken out of the, the doors back there. And you can put the chairs on the dollies. So thank you for your help. Everyone have a great week.